Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by viewers like you. This week on New Mexico in Focus, a tipster speaks up. A local attorney says he took allegations to the FBI about alleged corruption at APD's DWI unit and explains his outrage over the spreading scandal. All of those people need to do their job for this system to work. Yeah. And usually it does. But when it falls apart, even one cog in that wheel is enough to derail it. And called back. A city official pauses a plan for a new soccer stadium, sending it back to Albuquerque's Environmental Planning Commission. New Mexico in Focus starts now. Thanks for joining us this week. I'm senior producer Lou DeVizio. In the coming days, we'll learn the fate of 60 plus bills passed through this year's legislative session as the governor's signing deadline approaches on March 6th. Included in that list is Senate Bill 169, which would make changes to the state's land and conservation fund to provide money to outdoor recreation projects. In about 30 minutes, we return to an interview we first ran at the beginning of the year, as reporter Elizabeth Miller asks a wilderness advocate why the state has forfeited millions from the land and conservation fund over the last three years. Plus, I'll explain how that bill could help prevent similar losses in the future. A city hearing officer has pulled a yellow card on plans to construct a new soccer stadium for New Mexico United, sending the case back to Albuquerque's Environmental Planning Commission for review. In less than 20 minutes, we update you on the latest news regarding the stadium project and revisit our interview with a neighbor concerned about the proposed development at Balloon Fiesta Park. But first, a conversation with a tipster who may have helped launch the FBI investigation into alleged corruption at the Albuquerque Police Department's DWI unit. Journalist Elise Kaplan of City Desk Albuquerque sits down in our studio for an interview with legal malpractice attorney and former state rep Damon Eli. Kaplan asks Eli about the information he passed along to federal agents from potential victims of an alleged scheme to get drunk driving cases tossed out of court. Plus, he shares his perspective on how this scandal has damaged the reputation of the city's legal community and harmed the public's trust in the state's criminal justice system. Hi, Damon. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank I really you for appreciate having it. me. Absolutely. So we just heard from Lou that you passed some information to the FBI related to the ongoing federal investigation into the APD DWI unit, a local attorney and his paralegal. Walk me through that. What were you told? What was your initial reaction to what you were told? So I have to be careful about what I can say because um, it's an ongoing criminal investigation and I want to be wary of not compromising that. So I'm not going to give you any specifics. But I can say that it's been was more than one person, and that the information, uh, I it would be fair to say, upset me a great deal, and that I reacted to it immediately. Um, uh, and um, so when the story, this was all prior to the story coming out in the paper. So when the story came out, I mean, the whole thing I think is upsetting. So you went to the to the FBI. You told I them did. about this. Um, can you give me any kind of timeline? I can't. Okay. I, I I did talk to the U.S. Attorney before talking to you to make sure what information I could share with you because I don't know anything about the actual criminal investigation. I got to be careful about where I'm doing it, but I can't give you any specifics like that. But this was not after the story broke. This was not this year. This Correct. was a while ago. It was a while ago. Okay. Um, can you talk at all about kind of your role going forward? What did the agents do with the information? Kind of like how did you, after you told the FBI, what, what happened next? I thought, and, and part of the reason I agreed to this is that, you know, I, we so focus on people doing bad things. And in this situation, what I saw was once the information broke, once they had it, the FBI, the U.S. Attorney, really, I'm not a criminal lawyer, did their job and did it very effectively. And we'll talk a little bit when you want to, we can talk a little bit about what the district attorney did, what Sam Bregman did. Um, they did their jobs. And I think in this situation, which is very difficult to be in, uh, I was impressed that the, uh, the institution did their job both federally and state. Um, are you representing these potential victims? Any lawsuits in the future? Nope, nope. I, I, even if there was one, I wouldn't do it. I, I, I do think that kind of thing would compromise what's happened. I don't see a lawsuit, but I didn't talk to these people for that purpose. 
I talked to them because they needed a lawyer to guide them through the process. Obviously, I wouldn't charge for that. I want these people who are victims of, allegedly, of what's happened. I want them to feel comfortable with the process, and I became kind of a guide to them. Is there anything you can tell me about them? Like, kind of what was their demeanor coming to you? Kind of how did they? You know, I think, I think the one thing that I would say is, the one thing I would give you is, is these were young people. And that I was impressed because I think when you are willing to come forward and talk about somebody doing something wrong to you that has power, that shows real courage. And these people showed real courage. Um, why do you think they came to you? So, I get asked that a lot. I um, um, th you know, there are a handful of lawyers in town that are identified as lawyers that go after not just negligent lawyers, but sometimes lawyers that wrongful conduct. It's a pretty small bar we have, and I happen to be within that bar, and so I, it's, it wasn't shocking to me that I got the call. Um, and of course, you're not just an attorney. You were also a former legislator. Uh, with that in mind, is there any like policy or legislative fixes you can think of that might, I mean, I know nobody's been charged yet, we still have an idea of, of the, what these allegations are, but nothing is for sure, but is, knowing what you know, are there any policy fixes that you think could come down the line? Here's, here's kind of, let's step back for a minute. The short answer is, I don't think so, not yet. We'll have to see if there was some gap in the system. But this is a criminal justice system, and the word I want to focus on is system. Everybody in that system has to do their job. And you have to trust that they're going to do it with integrity. And when you have bad actors like this, really hard to catch it immediately. Now whether it went on too long and they didn't catch it, that I don't know. And maybe there needs to be things in terms of the auditing process. But the thing that I want to quickly say is, is that, so the short answer is no. I don't think so because it really would be an administrative thing that would happen at the local level. I think was really impressive to me and why ordinarily I would not be talking to you, but I'm talking to you today, is that um, our DA did, in my judgment, exactly the right thing. Because what he did was he dismissed those cases. He's got to relook at all of them. The public needs to understand that is exactly the right thing. He didn't play politics with it. Some DAs would have been tempted to do that. He was not. You can't do it in that situation. Once you have a law enforcement officer that is alleged to have done something that is wrongful and corrupt, you got to start all over again. I'm not sure that those cases aren't permanently compromised, but at least at the beginning, you rip off the Band-Aid and you move forward. You can't wait around, and that's what Sam Bregman did. And I thought, I'm going to take that opportunity to talk to you and your viewers and say, that's something that we should applaud. He did the right thing. It was gutsy. I'd love to explore that a little bit more. Why, why is it so important that you, know, that you have the DAs on one side, you have the defense attorneys on the other side? Kind of, why is it important that the DA kind of went out and dismissed these cases ahead of time? Because the DA is more than about convictions. It's more than about trying a case and convicting people. That's important. But what's most important is that the public trusts the integrity of the system. And, if, 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 and one of the main guardians of that integrity, in addition to judges, is the DA, has a principal role in protecting the integrity of the system. And that's what he did. He went, you know what, I can't go out there and say to the public, this is all going to be okay. This is not okay. We have allegations against these officers and we need to do something about it right now to assure the public that there is a basic integrity to the system. Um, from my own reporting, I know that this investigation kind of centers around, you know, the APD DWI officers allegedly working with at least one attorney, Thomas Clear, to make the cases go away. We've heard reports um, from a former court, court employee. There is obviously a, a recording that came forward last week about somebody with a different allegation. Of course, no one's been charged, but, you know, it's been in the news a lot. Um, Lots of people already don't think very highly of lawyers either. And since we're talking about public trust, you know, what does that do to kind of your profession and trust in, in lawyers as well? I, you know, I, you would think I, I spent the last, I don't know, 30 years going after lawyers and you would think that my attitude would be, gee, lawyers are bad and all that stuff. I, I don't. 
And I, is this great for lawyers? No, it clearly is not. It's not great for law enforcement people either. But ultimately, I think most police officers, just like most lawyers, go through their day-to-day -day lives with integrity and want to do the right thing. It is the few bad apples, right? Um, and that's true in this situation. But it hasn't made me cynical about fellow lawyers. I think the public um, should understand that most lawyers are decent people and trying to do their jobs. Um. Are you having conversations with other lawyers about how to kind of grapple with this or kind of how to, to move forward, how to kind of, yeah, what they're thinking and Not how to yet do because things. we really don't know. I mean, my involvement was so limited mm -hmm. that I, you know, I get the impression that I'm, I, it's the tip of the iceberg. It just seems like there's a lot of information coming out that I don't know anything about. Um, we have to wait and see how widespread this is. And I really don't know before lawyers do anything, if anything can be done. So obviously it's something that the disciplinary board is likely to look at, um, at least from a lawyer perspective, and that process will take place. But other than that, I, I can't think of anything today. Yeah. Um. I mean, obviously also DWI is a huge problem in our state and it's something that, you know, we grapple with um, kind of all over the state, but also in Albuquerque. Um, yeah. Can you talk at all about kind of what effect, um, you know, like allegations like this might have on just kind of how people view DWI or how they view the legal system if they get charged with DWI? I, I spent as a legislator a lot of time on criminal justice, even though I'm not a criminal lawyer. And the, the, the most certain deterrent to crime is swift and certain justice. We heard that over and over again. But along with that is assumed that there's an integrity to the process. And so that's why I thought it was so critical what the DA did, because he immediately went in to say, we're going to restore integrity to this process. Because as you say, DWI is a big issue. Crime is a big issue. And we want to be able to look at the public in the criminal justice field, even though I'm not a part of that. But the, the, as a le when I was a legislator, we wanted to be able to look at the public and say, we are working towards deterring crime by having a system with integrity where people get caught, they know justice is coming, and it's coming quickly. And I think, to be frank with you, we're still working on that. But you know, you know, sometimes out of these bad situations come surprisingly good things. And this was a real test for the DA, and I thought he passed it with flying colors. Yeah. Was this something you were expecting, kind of as, you know, you've been thinking about this with your involvement in it? Um, had you considered, you know, had you thought about the fact that the DA was going to have to dismiss all these cases? Was that something that you had been kind of anticipating all along? No, I, I, it, it, it didn't, I, because I'm not a criminal yeah. uh, defense lawyer or a prosecutor. I, I wasn't thinking about it that way. But when he did it, and did it so quickly, it was like, well, yes, of course, that's the right thing to do. That's what was so refreshing about it. Yeah. It wasn't like I was sitting there waiting for him to do something. He did it. It was, um, uh, you know, frankly, not exactly a lawyer term, but a pretty cool thing to do. Yeah. Um, and, of course, that's because of the Giglio disclosures, that that's why he had to do those cases. He's told us that he, um, you know, he wouldn't put forward witnesses with integrity. Can you talk at all about kind of why that's specifically important in DWI cases? Um, no way. No? Way okay. beyond my pay grade. <laughs> Can't okay. talk about it. Um, okay. Well, I've talked to other people who, you know, the officer is kind of the main witness in the case usually. Right. Um, you know, there's not another victim unless, you know, it's uh, more, more tragic than just DWI. Um, but yeah, there, it all relies on kind of the, way, the officer's credibility with the breathalyzer and the... Um, well, but think about, that's why we talk about a system, yeah. right? Because you start with the officer yeah. and then you have the investigator or the district attorney. Then you have the courts and you have the defense lawyer and you have the correction officers and the social workers. All of those people need to do their job for this system to work. And usually it does, but when it falls apart, even one cog in that wheel is enough to derail it. Yeah. Okay. Do you think this is going to have lasting impacts on the way this the whole system functions? I don't know. I, 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 I would think that depending on how long and how widespread it was, there'll be there almost will certainly be a review of what kind of auditing could have been done to catch it, but pretty hard when you're talking about people that you're supposed to trust. Mm -hmm 
to always be looking over their shoulder. That's a pretty hard thing to be doing, but I suspect there'll be some uh, additional checks and, and, and auditing procedures that'll come up out of this. Yeah. Um, do you expect to hear back from the FBI or the U.S. Attorney's Office? I don't. You don't? Okay. I don't. I think my involvement is an at an end. Okay. I'm surprised I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, I don't think so. Okay. Can we have you back on when, uh, after the charges break and maybe sure. you can give us a little bit more? Sure, of course. Yeah, I, I, again, I will run it by the U.S. Attorney's Office, but I think once we know what's going on, I'll, I'll be happy to give you whatever information I can. Well, thank you so much, Damon. I really thank appreciate you sitting down here with me today. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Grant the Lord to the long-suffering nation of Ukraine, to all the people who defend freedom, peace, democracy, peace, health, and happiness for many and blessed years. God grant them many years. God grant them many years. God grant them many blessed years. New Mexico United's push to build a new stadium at Balloon Fiesta Park may be hitting a roadblock. Last month, a land use hearing officer ordered the soccer stadium project back to Albuquerque's Environmental Planning Commission for review. The reason he gave was, quote, improper notice. The potential setback for United comes as neighbors have voiced concerns for months over the team's plans to build the stadium at Balloon Fiesta Park. In January, before the project was sent back to the city's EPC, Andy Lyman, editor of the alternative news weekly The Paper, spoke with one of those concerned neighbors about why she and others want a foul called on the new field. Brooke Jordy, uh, thank you for, for coming in and welcome. Uh, can you start off with sort of explaining to viewers who you are and your role in this appeal of the stadium over by uh, the, or at the, the Balloon Fiesta Park? Sure, I'm one of the neighbors who lives in that little green patch just west of the diversion channel. Um, and so there is a group of us who have been concerned about the building of the United Stadium within Balloon Fiesta Park. Um, I myself have only lived in Albuquerque for about almost six years. And it, the people in that neighborhood have been there for decades. Um, and many of them are concerned about the quality of life being impacted and um, environmental pollution in the area should a stadium be built at Balloon Fiesta Park. Um, so I am newer to the area, but I am um, equally as concerned as they are about the impact of any potential stadium use within our neighborhood. And so you are an attorney, but you're not representing any neighborhood association or neighbors. You're, you're just a neighbor that has some knowledge about how to file appeals and things like that. Right, I am an attorney. I am not the attorney for the neighbors. We are doing this pro se as of now. Um, there are a group of us who are kind of the um, main individuals behind it. And then there are approximately, I think, 72 individuals and three or four neighborhood associations who are opposed to building the stadium. And those are the individuals who signed on to the appeal. Okay. Uh, my understanding of the appeal process is it starts with uh, um, a city hearing officer and then it may go to the city council. Can you share sort of where it is in that process? So we're appealing the EPC's approval of the site plan or zoning change to permit a multi-use stadium um, to be built within Balloon Fiesta Park. So the Environmental Planning Commission had to approve before the lease could be approved for United. We appealed the EPC decision um, and we appealed that to uh, the planning department is the one who, who organizes the appeal. A land use hearing officer is the individual who would hear the appeal and then it can go forward from there if um, we want to continue with the appeal. Eventually we could end up in district court. Right now we are waiting, because there are so many of us, it, so many applicants, it makes it harder for the city to organize how that appeal is heard. Um, so they are currently working on gathering the record and will put together the 
the record essentially to be sent to the land use hearing officer, which is also called a LUHO. And then once the LUHO gets it, we'll schedule, they will schedule a hearing for us. You sort of mentioned this earlier. Can you just spend just a brief moment uh, talking about what area of Albuquerque we're talking about? I think maybe a lot of people only go there for the balloon fiesta. Sure. So geographically, what are we talking about and uh, who lives there? So Balloon Fiesta Park is in that North Valley, Alameda and Edith area, which is where I live. There are several neighborhood associations surrounding that area. There's the Maria Dyer's Neighborhood Association. There's the North Edith Corridor Association. Um, there's the Alameda um, North Valley Association and then the Wildflower Neighborhood Association. So within that area, there are lots of people who have multi-generational homes, who inherited their property from grandparents who've been there, like I said, for decades. There are many people who have wild um, or you know, domesticated animals such as livestock. They have sheep, um, goats, cows, horses, all just within my neighborhood. Um, and so most people up there either have some sort of agricultural interest or enjoy the more agricultural, more rustic feel of that neighborhood. Um, what were some of the concerns both in the process of how this happened and also what are the concerns of, of what might happen if the stadium is built? The concerns regarding the process, so in terms of the EPC decision, New Mexico United and the city of Albuquerque have failed to do a comprehensive environmental impact study to see how building a stadium in that area would affect air, water, noise qualities. Um, it is right off of the Amafka Channel, which is that north diversion ditch that people know about. That carries all of Albuquerque's runoff stormwater and takes it into the Rio Grande. So any kind of fallout um, or water pollution that would come from increased use of Balloon Fiesta Park, such as increased fireworks um, from the stadium, would pollute that water with all of that fallout that comes from fireworks. There, it's also a very quiet area. Um, like I mentioned, there's a lot of wildlife. We're not too far from the Bosque. So there are protected waterways that are in play here. Um, those concerns, and then also a big one is that the city and New Mexico United have presented themselves as partners in building the stadium and getting the plans in place. Those plans are extremely lacking in detail. And on top of that, the city is supposed to be, the city council is supposed to be a quasi, um, have a quasi judicial decision making role in this process. And they have represented themselves as being an agent, um, a partner of New Mexico United. And so consensus planning, who has the planning contract for the stadium, has said that they are an agent for the city of Albuquerque and New Mexico United. To be a quasi, to fill that quasi judicial decision making role, you have to be neutral. So, how can the city be neutral in deciding for themselves um, whether those plans are acceptable? This is, we've been sort of been down this road before, specifically with downtown Albuquerque. There was sort of a push to build a stadium there. Residents of downtown said, no way. Um, and I realize this is not, this is far from your job or anybody else in your neighborhood's job. Um, do you see an area in Albuquerque that this might work outside of uh, your area? I have heard that some people would be interested in it being built kind of around the South UNM area. There have been some redevelopment um, projects going on there that would be a better fit. Um, I'm not personally aware of other places within the city. One of the issues might just be that um, we don't need a stadium within the city. And I think one of the big concerns of the neighbors is that 
the city and New Mexico United feel like they're under the gun to some degree to get this pushed through. And in doing so, have been sloppy to say the least in how these plans have unfolded. Like I said, a lack of environmental impact study, um, trying to hurry people through the process, people feeling like they don't have time or notice to fully participate in that process. And in pushing all of that through, what they're asking the residents of Albuquerque to do is give up some concerns of that environmental impact and give up some concerns of how our state funds are being used. So if they had taken the time to really put this in place, then we wouldn't be in this situation. Again, not your, your, your job to, to figure this out, and I know you're only speaking on behalf of yourself and not the neighborhoods. Um, do you see, is there, is there any way that United and the city can sort of rectify the situation and build a stadium? What, what could be done to um, sort of mitigate the damage that's been done? If anything. There's a lot <laughs> in that question. I think a good start would be, like I said, the environmental impact studies. Figuring out how this stadium will truly impact current residents of, you know, all of Bernalillo County, really. And I recognize that Mayor Keller believes that we aren't his constituents. And so our opinion on the stadium being built is of less concern than his constituents. However, the air pollution and water pollution, that carries much greater concern for all of New Mexico, really, if it's going into the Rio Grande, then that's going to affect downstream, literally, the rest of New Mexico. And we have, we should know by now that you can't unring the bell when it comes to environmental pollution. It's 2024. We have seen this time and time again. If you push things through and say, well, it's economic development. Oh, it's good for businesses. What's good for businesses isn't necessarily good for a community and was, isn't necessarily good for the environment. So there's that aspect. On top of that, I think engaging with individuals who live in my area where, yes, I recognize we're not Mayor Keller's constituents, um, but we have a vested interest in protecting the way that land is used in our neighborhood. And the majority of people who are for the stadium don't actually live in the vicinity of the stadium and will be somewhat protected from any of the fallout of the stadium. Peter Trevisani, for example, lives in Santa Fe, so he won't be affected negatively by fireworks every time there's a game. Um, I will also say that the city's proposal involves building the stadium next to the Nazareth, the old Nazareth landfill, which has unusually high levels of landfill gases because the city never built the proper venting system that they were supposed to. And so we have very high levels of methane gas that could be released and is, it's currently unsafe as, as it exists today for just the balloon fiesta usage. So building a stadium next to a landfill gas uh, concentration area is, is dangerous for individuals going to the stadium, building the stadium, living near the stadium. And one of our big problems, the neighbor's big problems with the stadium's plan is that it doesn't account for any of that. The issue has been raised with the city and it has fallen on deaf ears. Nothing has been done. There has been no, what appears to be no good faith attempt to rectify the concerns that neighbors have voiced in public comment. And I think that that says all it needs to. Okay. Well, I'll be watching closely. Brooke, thank you again for coming in. Thank you, Andy. After years of forfeiting millions in federal dollars for outdoor conservation and recreation projects, state legislators passed a bill last month to expand access and make it easier for the state to distribute money from its land and conservation fund. 
Senate Bill 169, which awaits a signature from the governor, appropriates $10 million from the fund, removes a population cap eligibility requirement, and prioritizes projects for tribal and smaller governments. Lawmakers hope the legislation will help the state avoid wasting millions in federal money as it has for years now. In January, journalist Elizabeth Miller spoke with Michael Casaus, the state director of the Wilderness Society, about New Mexico's troubled history with the fund and how that federal money could have helped city parks and open spaces. So the money we just heard about from Lou was part of the Federal Land and Water Conservation Fund, which is meant for exactly what it sounds like, land conservation and outdoor recreation projects for communities. And the Wilderness Society campaigned for this pot of money for more than a decade. Why? The Land and Water Conservation Fund is one of this nation's most important and successful uh, conservation funding programs uh, in the past 50 or 60 years. Um, since it was established by Congress in 1965, billions of dollars um, have been used by LWCF to uh, build new parks, uh, conserve important areas, and to provide access to um, uh, recreational opportunities for hunters, anglers, uh, and other outdoor recreationists. And so <clears throat> for us at the Wilderness Society, um, uh, this program was um, uh, needed to be uh, reestablished by Congress, uh, and it also needed to be fully funded. Um, when Congress established the fund, um, it was, set, it was um, scheduled to sunset after 50 years. Um, and so we worked really hard to, re, um, to reauthorize, uh, to work with Congress to reauthorize LWCF. Um, and Congress never, in its 50-some year history, had never really um, fully funded the program. So we also worked uh, to ensure that the program was funded um, at a level of $900 million as, is, as it was originally intended. Um, so it's one of those iconic uh, conservation programs that, um, that really impacts uh, every county uh, in the United States, uh, and it's had a tremendous impact in every county uh, in New Mexico. Right, and since, like, since 1965, it's supported more than 1,200 projects around the state of New Mexico, and that's, that's reached every county. So the program seemed to have been working in the past for a while, and then what happened to it? I think what happened, as I referenced, is that Congress was never really fully funding it. <clears throat> and so as a result, states weren't, re weren't receiving um, really high levels of appropriations. So one of the programs of LWCF is called the State and Local Grant Assistance Program. And that program is meant to provide matching dollars to states, local governments, and tribes to support their outdoor recreational uh, visions. And so um, when, um, when Congress was um, contemplating uh, how best to fund that program, um, they, um, for whatever reason, never really gave states the, uh, the level of appropriation that, uh, that was originally intended. So maybe in the early 2000s, New Mexico um, started to receive less and less LWCF funds for this state and local grant assistance program. Um, in some years, it was receiving $150,000 or $250,000. And so um, <clears throat> I think during those years, uh, New Mexico State Parks, who administers the program for the state of New Mexico, um, really didn't think it was worthwhile to put out a broad statewide call for proposals from local governments and tribes to apply for those funds and instead use that limited funding for state parks priorities, uh, which do benefit all of New Mexico, uh, all of New Mexicans, but it wasn't really going to the local governments and tribes um, as it was intended. Um, <clears throat> and so with the passage of the, uh, the Dingle Act in, in 2019, which permanently reauthorized the program, which we were really excited about. And with the subsequent passage of uh, the Great American Outdoors Act in 2020, uh, which fully funded the program, the result was that New Mexico and other states um, started to receive um, higher levels of funding. In New Mexico, we started to receive about $3 million a year. And that funding is based on kind of a population formula that the LWCF program has. Right. So to back up and unpack some of that a little bit, it was like the state was receiving so little money that it didn't make sense to run a competitive grant program to 
like it was too many people trying to reach for the same pie effectively. Like there weren't, there wasn't enough money for them to dole out. So they were using it for state parks projects. And I think the last of these community grants we saw go out in 2005 to, a, I think it was a swimming pool in Lovington, yeah. right? And so we get the passage of the Dingle Act in 2019 and the Great American Outdoors Act in 2020. And this does kind of change the stakes. So what, um, what did you see change in how the state was sort of trying to rise to meet this new occasion? When, when those two um, critical bills passed and we were anticipating New Mexico receiving three plus million dollars a year, um, I began to, um, to meet with Energy, Minerals and Natural Resources Department and New Mexico State Parks um, to see um, how we can reestablish the program, which, uh, as I mentioned, really hasn't been fun ha hadn't been functioning in, in nearly 20 years. So I think the first step was to reestablish the program, uh, essentially from the ground up, hire an, uh, an LWCF coordinator, which state parks did, and then importantly, to put out a, a request for proposals to, uh, to local and tribal governments across the state. Were people aware that this funding source had even been available in the past by the time you started doing some of this outreach to communities? Yeah, the Wilderness Society at that point, uh, when the request for proposals was put out, we began to outreach to over 50 local governments and tribes across the state uh, to do just that, educate them and inform them that this grant opportunity was available to them to advance their outdoor recreation priorities in their communities. Uh, we did kind of a series of surveys, like pre and post interviews, um, and what we found was that the vast majority weren't aware of LWCF in general. Um, and um, about 90% of folks that we talked to didn't even know that the request for proposals was out there. Um, <clears throat> so I think we played a critical role in really educating those local and tribal governments about LWCF, why it was important, and also um, about the, the matching grant opportunity um, uh, LWCF does provide matching grants, so local governments and tribes um, have to um, come up with the other half of the money. It's a one-to-one -one match uh, gr program. And so um, uh, at that point, um, I think uh, local governments and tribes um, were very interested in it, um, and many of them did apply that first year. Got it, okay. And so the National Park Service, which administers this program like on a federal level, gives states three years to come up with projects to spend this money. And we talked about the state parks was using it for a while. And then New Mexico kind of struggled to identify projects beginning you know, somewhere around when the money started increasing again in 2019, 2020. And state officials recently admitted, it, admitted that they've forfeited $5 million since 2021. Can you help characterize what kind of loss that is? Yeah, that was a tremendous loss um, uh, for New Mexico, for our local communities, for our tribal communities. Uh, it was really disappointing. Um, but, um, you know, as I mentioned, it's, it's a challenge to prop up a, a, a large grant program from scratch. Um, but, um, you know, what ended up happening was, <clears throat> I think since 2020, New Mexico had received about $9 million, $9.5 million in this stateside funding. They have three years, as you mentioned, to appropriate those funds. And so in 2021 uh, was the first year in nearly two decades that state parks put out the call for proposals. They received um, 11 applications from local governments and two applications from uh, two of the Pueblos. So there were 13 in total. Um, and um, but for a variety of reasons, um, <clears throat> those programs have yet to be funded or not funded. Um, in 2022, another request for proposals was was put out there, and another 13 or so um, local governments applied. Um, so, despite the fact that we see about you know 26 or so uh, local governments applying for the funds. Um, um, due to a variety of reasons, those funds have, haven't been decided either way. And so unfortunately, um, because some of the funds that were appropriated back in 2020 weren't used uh, within the three-year timeline, 
um, um, about five million dollars was have it was um, was given back to the federal government. Right. So you can imagine the, the 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 city parks, the swimming pools, the ball fields, the open spaces that could have been created with this funding. Um, but we're committed to working with the Lujan Grisham administration and state parks to ensure that moving forward um, that this program lives up to its promise. Right, right. I mean, I think it's been like about $2 million each year for 21, 22, and 23. And we've had these applications sitting there that, that haven't even yet been submitted to the federal government. I think they were going to try to be, try to submit them this month. So hopefully some action here. Hopefully there's still money to, to be spent on supporting some of these projects, but it's been, it's been a long time. What are you hearing from some of the communities that you've worked with on how they're feeling about how long it's taken for this application process to move forward? Yeah, I think it's been a mix of excitement, but also disappointment. Um, as you can imagine, if you're a local uh, Parks and Rec uh, director and you apply for an LWCF grant in 2021, and you still haven't heard one way or another whether you got it or not, you're kind of confused and frustrated. Um, we've seen instances in some counties where, you know, um, they've, they've basically given up on the project. Uh, that they had applied to develop. Um, we know that Acoma Pueblo, for example, applied for an LWCF grant, and because it was taking so long for decisions to be made, they found the funding elsewhere, and they've actually completed the project, and they've withdrawn their, their application. And we did see five uh, local governments and tribes withdraw their applications from that 2021 pool. Right. So high levels of frustration, but also excitement because Many uh, communities across the state are developing outdoor recreation plans. They need funding. Smaller rural communities don't have a lot of money to purchase land to develop a new park, or uh, they don't have the funding to build that new soccer field that the community wants. And so we view this LWCF stateside grant really as a 50% off coupon, coupon that local communities can use towards implementing that outdoor recreation vision. Right, and there's work underway, or potentially, in this next legislative session to help some of these rural communities access some of this funding. Can we talk just real quickly about um, what state lawmakers could do to help prevent losing further funding? Yeah, despite the challenges, there are tremendous opportunities to get this foot get this program back on firm footing. Um, one of the um, <clears throat> challenges that we saw was that um, uh, local communities were having trouble coming up with that match, that 50% match. And so um, our colleagues at Western Resource Advocates, another nonprofit, uh, discovered this um, long forgotten um, program uh, that the state legislature in New Mexico developed in 1973. And what that program did was provide a pot of state money uh, into this LWCF supplemental fund that local small rural communities could tap into uh, to enable them to have that one-to-one -one match. Um, unfortunately, the legislature, for some unknown reason, stopped putting money into that fund in 1985, and so it's essentially been on the books but not utilized. And what our goal is to, uh, working with our state Senate pro tem, um, Mimi Stewart, to introduce legislation here um, next week to reestablish that supplemental fund, to put some state money into it, and to amend it to, to meet the needs of, of communities today. Thank you so much for coming in to speak with me about this today. Thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure. I contacted the State Energy, Minerals, and Natural Resources Department for an update on several of the concerns Elizabeth raised in her reporting. The department tells me state parks submitted nearly $1.4 million in grant applications this January after that interview was recorded. That includes four applications submitted by New Mexico communities back in 2021. EMNRD says one of those grants has been already fulfilled, with the National Park Service awarding more than $850,000 for outdoor recreation legacy partnership grants. I'm also told state parks hired a new Land and Water Conservation Fund coordinator in mid-February. The department says he's begun reviewing applications from 2022, aiming to submit them by a July deadline. 2023 applications will be submitted during the next funding opportunity in early 2025. Yeah. <laughs>
It's been two years since Russian forces invaded Ukraine, and a group of Ukrainians in our state wants to make sure everyone remembers the war is not over. Just this week, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky announced 31,000 Ukrainian soldiers have been killed. That's the first time he's given a hard figure on his military's death toll. According to the UN Human Rights Monitoring Mission in Ukraine, more than 30,000 Ukrainian civilians have been killed since the invasion began, with thousands more held captive. The international community has shown support for Ukraine, but without providing concrete military assistance beyond weapon systems and ammunition. That may soon change, though. Monday, while speaking to 20 European heads of state in Paris, French President Emmanuel Macron said, quote, we will do everything needed so Russia cannot win the war, end quote. Macron did not rule out the possibility of Western troops being sent to Ukraine. That announcement prompted an abrupt response from the Kremlin, with a spokesperson telling reporters, if that were to happen, a direct conflict between Russia and NATO would be inevitable. Now, as international leaders strategize and the death toll rises, here in our state, the Ukrainian Americans of New Mexico are rallying support. We've spoken to representatives from the group before on NMIF. This past weekend, executive producer of cultural affairs, Michael Kamins, documented their event at Albuquerque Civic Plaza, memorializing the grim milestones of Russia's invasion two years ago. відбувається з нашими дітьми. Більше з них мають психологічні розлади. Can you imagine our kids wake up to this sound? Our kids carry the trauma that's been put on them by the air raids. by the hostilities and atrocities that God will soothe their spiritual, physical and mental anguish. Heal them, we pray you, O Lord. Hear us and graciously have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Suffering nation of Ukraine to all the people who defend freedom, peace, democracy, peace, health, and happiness for many and blessed years. God grant them many years. God grant them many years. God grant them many blessed years in health and happiness. In health and happiness. God grant them many blessed years. In blessed repose, grant to Lord the eternal rest to your departed servants, all those who have lost their lives in defense of the freedom of Ukraine, all the soldiers, all the innocent lives of children and civilians, that their memory be eternal. The eternal memory, the eternal memory, bless and repose, eternal memory.
Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by the viewers like you.